Hi guys, I'm so excited to talk about this particular classic and contemporary pairing of the novels Little Women by Louise May Alcott and March by Geraldine Brooks. No spoilers for either, I'll be speaking broadly on these titles. Normally I try to keep my videos under the 20 minute mark, but no way that's happening with this one, so grab some snacks. Little Women was published in two volumes in 1868 and 69. March was published in 2005 and won the Pulitzer Prize the following year. I reread Little Women in November of 2019, not because of the, the movie coming out. My coworker and I had just planned a buddy read for then, but I was fascinated by how the movie's release dredged up people's intense personal reactions to the book. And I think it's to Alcott's credit that people are inspired to have those kinds of reactions that's artistically intentional, but only up to a point. And I was also struck by how many of the, the takes seem to come from old impressions of this book rather than what's in the text. So let's discuss. This was probably around the 15th time that I had read Little Women, but that's because of how I read as a child, where if the book was over, but I wanted to spend more time with those characters, I'd turn back to the first page and reread, and I'd do that three times in a row until I'd had my fill and moved on to another story. So really the last time that I had read this book, I think I was 17 over a decade ago, so I was aware that I could end up having entirely different feelings about it now. Um, and I do have different feelings in some respects, but not in the way that people fear when they think about revisiting old favorites. So I want to say up front, especially for those of you who have never read this or maybe haven't for a while, that Alcott is just a skilled writer in a way I never fully appreciated before. There's a, a natural rhythm to her dialogue. Her humor is so effective. She explores emotions in a thorough and delicate way. Her themes are both obvious and deceptively nuanced. She blends interiority with a well-structured plot. And so to treat this as a passe essay collection on the limited choices of women is to overlook craft, to overlook Alcott's main motivation of telling a moving and entertaining story. That story focuses on four young American women called the March Sisters who are growing up in New England. Their father is away in the South acting as a chaplain in the Civil War. And so Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy, ages 16 to 12, are being raised by their mother, Marmee, and their family servant, Hannah. And despite the connotations of having a servant, the Marches are poor relative to their social circle. Mr. March lost most of the family's money when Meg and Joe were young. And since then, they've had to penny pinch and live the sort of life that's considered unfashionable. One of the book's primary questions is how much money and happiness are interrelated. And although I would have concluded that they're not at all related when reading this as a child, as an adult reading between some lines, I was less sure. Put a pin in that for March. The first part of the book follows the Marches for a year in all their girlhood experiences, from everyday life to light and fun-hearted episodes to sobering dark episodes as well. There's a full range of what life can throw at you in a year, and everything is given a kind of weight. It's not just the serious things in life that matter and that affect your character. Character, in the moral sense of the word, is of major importance in Little Women. In the second chapter, Marmee gives each of the girls an individualized copy of The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, which was a hugely influential 17th century Christian narrative following a protagonist named Christian who's trying to travel from his city of destruction to a celestial city. And you can already tell it's an allegory for battling and overcoming original sin to be worthy of eternal salvation. Now, this was my first time reading Little Women, where I understood the allusions to the Pilgrim's Progress, which appear most notably in a series of four early chapters, where each of the girls in turn tries to overcome some personal shortcoming. Before this, I was just like, okay, I mean, these chapters are enjoyable enough, but I kind of feel like sermons. This is a common reaction to certain elements of Little Women because as a text it has deep Christian roots, but I want to point out a few distinctions that I didn't necessarily expect to find on this reread. One of them my colleague Alice, who's Christian, noted that for a book that's known for a religious bent, both the Bible and God himself are rarely invoked. We were surprised by the type of Christianity we found in here. It doesn't at all have that vaguely odious framing that you should treat others well on earth so that you're rewarded when you die. You know, to a striking degree, it has much more of a 
the goodness for the sake of goodness itself ethos that making life more pleasant for other people is its own reward and that having an honest and reflective relationship with your conscience enriches your life. Truthfully, it was kind of weird for me to identify more with the religious messages now as an atheist approaching 30 than I did any time I read this book up to the age of 17 when I was being raised Catholic and going to church every week. Something that was profound for me this time around was noticing how sensitively Alcott records the struggle to be a good person. You can talk about virtue until you're blue in the face, but in the everyday experience of life, it's so easy to be lazy, to be selfish and thoughtless and resentful, even cruel at times. Jo, the second sister, has a temper and can hold a grudge, and this is the, the focus point of her Pilgrim's Progress episode. And one of the loveliest moments of the book comes when something upsetting happens due to her anger. And she says to her mother, you don't know, you can't guess how bad it is. It seems as if I could do anything when I'm in a passion. I get so savage, I could hurt anyone and enjoy it. I'm afraid I shall do something dreadful someday and spoil my life and make everybody hate me. <laughs> Which, apart from some of the diction, is very much the emotional register that I used to speak in as a child. And, you know, her gentle do-gooder mother, in response, says... Well, actually, I have a temper too. I'm angry every day of my life. You just can't tell anymore because I control it. Um, it's quite a quote, and it's another point that reminds you that the characters in this book all have serious flaws in one way or another. And I appreciate this frankness of Alcott, that being a good person is hard. Like, very few of us are so inclined by nature. I also admire how Alcott captures the specificity of emotions, that we call a certain array of feelings sadness or jealousy or joy, but our individual experiences of these terms can vary widely. As you just heard in that passage from Joe, her anger is not like her sister's anger. It has its own force and affects her differently. So you're in a situation where within personalities, each trait has a sort of mini personality of its own. And this is why I think Beth is minimized as a character more than she deserves in the general discourse. At least the Beth we get in the first volume. She's meek and shy, but her shyness is particular to her. It has quirks and angles to it. So you get all these people on the page who feel real. And <laughs> it's really no surprise that people get to the point where they're personally invested in certain characters and like seriously irritated by others. I've gone through my whole different range of who is my favorite at any given moment. When I was really young it was Beth and then I moved on to Joe and icon for tomboys everywhere. But as I've gotten older honestly it's been um, Amy who's remained my favorite and I know she has lots of haters so come at me. Now for the part I'm guessing some of you expected closer to the top, gender and feminism. This could really be its own separate video series so I'm only brushing on a few points here. If you go into this novel expecting a 21st century brand of empowerment, you will be disappointed. I don't think there's much empowerment per se in here, but there is a fundamental feminism to Little Women in that it treats the domestic and inner lives of women and girls as valuable, and in that it has equally well-realized male and female characters. I mean, feminism at heart argues that men and women and people of all genders are equally human with everything that entails, both positive and negative. My colleague Alice had never read this before, and she was delighted by Lori, who's the March's neighbor and grows up with them. She thought that he was just as interesting as the sisters and that the book treated him as such. So PSA, be wary of pseudo-feminist takes on Lori from people who haven't read this in a while. I said it. There's an unusual and I think refreshing treatment of male and female friendship in this novel. But the girl's friendship with Lori inevitably highlights the differences in their opportunities. Lori doesn't care about studying, but he's the one who gets to go to college. Everybody expects a career from him, but all they expect from the sisters is to find husbands. And this rankles Joe in particular because she has ambitions as a writer. Side note, Joe March in the book doesn't do what her movie counterparts always seem to do. She doesn't write a meta text called Little Women, just in case any of you thought that was a thing. There are going to be elements of gender in here that are outdated, and the big one to me was the concept of a woman's influence. It's remarked throughout that Lori is a better, more principled man because of the feminine wisdom of the March family, and there's both truth and sexism inherent in the framing of those relationships. We all have role models growing up, people whose opinions of us 
really matter and who shape our lives because of that. But it's also like, uh, we get it. The angelic touch of women makes men slightly more bearable. whoop de doo apart from being an absolute drag to have to model humanity to roughly the other half of humanity. This concept is so condescending to men. Much is made of the four paths for women that the book features. The idea that this is some kind of a blueprint for the valid ways to be a woman. First of all, even this idea that different women want different things is that combination of obvious and groundbreaking that characterizes so much of feminist thought. Second, it's fun to consider how, you know, whereas at the time Joe was the oddball figure, the one with the less acceptable life choices, you can argue that currently, in many circles, Meg would be the oddball, the one whose only ambition is domesticity. So much so that the, the Greta Gerwig movie version clearly casts Joe as the modern and relatable one and strives to defend Meg's choices. I also need to mention how much I love that this book has an excellent romance, a favorite of mine, and a sort of anti-romance because Alcott was essentially forced by her readers and publisher to include a romance she didn't want to include. Overall, closing this mini feminist portion, I can't stress enough that this book was heavily autobiographical and that I think there are four paths represented for women because Louise May Alcott had three sisters. If she'd had a fourth or fifth sister, I firmly believe we would have had five or six different paths illustrated in this book. Um, and so this is where we maybe reach the, um, the limit of usefulness of Death of the Author, because given the circumstances, I don't think Alcott was trying to make a statement that these are the four cardinal options for all womankind. It, it was her family. Now, if you've never read this book before and you go to do so now, which I strongly endorse, I wouldn't be surprised if you found the first few chapters stilted. And I do think that's a quality that fades as the book progresses, but it also made me consider how sensibilities shift and how things that can seem natural in one era can come across as affected now. There is that Brady Bunch quality to Little Women, partly because of the time period and partly because the earliest sections were more intentionally written for children. It's kind of a, a Hobbit, Lord of the Rings situation in terms of intended audience as the story progresses. Another thing I don't want to ignore is sentimentality. So many discussions of Little Women either overlook this quality or treat it like the story's only signature quality. So let's address head on, this is a sentimental novel, which in some ways I'm hesitant to say, as, you know, an adult reader, I have found uh, literary fiction cringeworthy when it verges into the sentimental, and I don't want to turn people off this book, but it's worth interrogating the premise that sentimentality is automatically cheapening, right? That calling little women what it is, is automatically a criticism. For some it would be, I've used the term in that way <laughs> in some contexts, but when we say sentimental, often that's coded language for unearned emotion instead of a specific type of emotional register. This is the latter. The emotions in here are earned. And Little Women is also part of a long historical tradition of this type of writing. So I would argue that in a really interesting way, sentimentality is an integral part of the artistry of this novel, rather than something that limits the novel's artistry. But even more notable than sentimentality for me is nostalgia. And I don't mean readers' personal nostalgia, as powerful as that is in relation to this book. I'm referring to the relationship between the two volumes, the first of which is Little Women, and the second of which is sometimes called Good Wives, although I, I think that maybe was a title that Alcott herself didn't endorse. Basically, she wrote the first volume, Following the Sisters, over the course of a year, and it was so successful, beyond all expectations, that by popular demand she immediately went on to write the second volume, which skips forward three years to complete these coming-of-age narratives. And they are recognizable as one cohesive book, but the second volume is much bleaker. It's like you leave the warmth and rosiness of the fireside to step out into the street where there's a sudden chill to the wind. It's growing up, seeing the possibilities of life narrow, realizing that each choice you make takes you further from the other potential paths you could have taken. Jo struggles the most to find her path, and so she becomes more of the main focal point in the second volume. She feels wistful looking back on the happy times with her sisters now that they're all pulled in different directions. And she also goes from being eager to get out into the world to build her own life, to fearing having to go out into the world and actually build that life. So 
Good Wives is a classic example of metatextual children's literature that comments on the gap between childhood and adulthood and in some ways shows a longing for an earlier, simpler time. Obviously, I can make a whole series just on Little Women for an audience of one, but I'm not gonna do that and I'm gonna move on instead to March because this is peak classic and contemporary pairing in that March highlights what Little Women is not, the things it purposely does not address, which I don't mean as an indictment because every book chooses to exclude certain elements of the world to focus on others and Little Women is its own sculpted, self-contained world, but its silences are deafening. Let's start small before we get into history and such. Mr. March. I only referenced him once earlier in reference to his going away to be a chaplain in the Civil War, and that's because his absence is so much more instrumental than his presence, and in the now 15 times I had read Little Women, I never thought about that for a second until I read March. I can't get into specifics without revealing details of his fate, but Little Women has so little use for a father figure, and after I read this, I went back into the classic and was noticing all these things about the uh, treatment and relative relevance of this character. It's perfect breeding grounds for a pastiche. Who is this man? And what did he experience during the only historical event referenced in an otherwise curiously sheltered narrative, the Civil War? Oh, just that. Nothing too consequential, Louisa. Yeah, you could be forgiven for forgetting that the Civil War is raging during the first volume of Little Women. Mr. March being gone is the only indication that this earth-shattering conflict is in fact affecting people. But truthfully, one of the reasons it took me so long to read March was that I wasn't that interested in hearing another Union soldier story. Battlefield books aren't so much my thing, especially not ones set during the Civil War. If I need to scratch that itch, I'll just reread The Killer Angels, you know? But although this, this has its share of dramatic, violent scenes, it's not a panoramic battle-to-battle -battle chronicle by any means. The book is much more focused on Mr. March's character, again, in the moral sense of the word. He's a measured, cerebral idealist who believes in the fundamental dignity and grace of mankind, and Brooks is interested in testing what happens to idealism when confronted with the worst of mankind. One of my favorite sections, especially in retrospect, is an extended flashback. Mr. March is reflecting on his time when, as a young traveling salesman, he was invited to stay at a southern plantation, and he was enamored with the owner named Mr. Clement, uh, Mr. Clement was an intellectual who had so many of the traits of the genteel, old, moneyed South. Mr. March enjoyed his society. The fact that they both valued bookish wisdom and Christian goodness, and of course mixed in with all this scholarship and camaraderie, was racism of the most elemental kind because Mr. Clement was a slave owner. And so he could talk about the differences between the races in the same erudite, slightly removed way, he discussed classical studies. Here is a prime example. Slavery will wither in time, not my time, not my son's, yet wither it will, as the African grows morally in each succeeding generation. His mere residence among us has already wrought a great and happy change in his condition. We have raised him out of the night and into the light, Mr. March, but the work is far from complete. It is our place to act the role of stern father, we should not rush them out of their childhood as it were. And if sometimes that means a resort to punishment, so be it as the father must punish the wayward child. It made me think about how still too often these days we equate racism with general ignorance, and it's not just racism that's treated this way. We act like all of society's ills exist independently of intelligence, curiosity, and education, as though the most disgusting viewpoints ever held weren't recorded in learned philosophical tracts that were then passed on to other high-minded people. I mean, you know, even now, when hypothetically, let's posit that someone reprehensible says reprehensible things on the floor of Congress and everyone marvels, but that fine sir went to Yale. Surely he knows better. I mean, he probably learned some of that stuff at Yale or at least had aspects of that worldview reinforced there. And I'm not exempt from this. I mean, I went to a much you know, lesser known 
type of school in that vein. And of course, I'm not saying that well-regarded universities are necessarily hotbeds of intellectual filth, but intellectualism is not by definition a straight path to enlightened goodness. And Brooks really shows the seduction of this white Southern lifestyle on an eager, impressionable man who's then confronted with ugly beliefs, but they're couched in the same rhetoric and rigor of speech as the beliefs he shares. Race is of course a feature in Little Women in that it's a, an inescapable feature of the background, the whole grounding of these narratives. Alcott was writing about the different life paths open at the time to white women. Of course she was. The very availability and plurality of paths were things that were restricted to white women, even as they themselves lived somewhat restricted lives. And I don't think that makes this book terrible or worthy of righteous chastisement, but it does make it unworthy of universality, a sort of base universality that Little Women has been granted since its publication. I'll leave a piece below that I really like by Caitlin Greenbridge on this subject if you want to think about it more. Ultimately, March reminds you of the ever-present racial politics and lived realities of the time, partly through Mr. March's interactions in the South, but then also through his abolitionism and subsequent financial ruin when he returns North. Now, so much of this narrative is inspired by the letters and journals of Bronson Alcott, Louise May Alcott's father. He was not gentle in the way that Mr. March is, but he was an idealistic reformer, an abolitionist, an advocate for women's rights, against corporal punishment for children, a proto-vegan even, uh, and famously a transcendentalist who was friends with the likes of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, who both appear as characters in this book. And parts of March are grounded in that era's cultural community of Concord, Massachusetts, in a way that makes Little Women feel quite claustrophobic. We so rarely venture outside the family unit in that book compared to this one. Remember how early in this video, if you can cast your mind back that far, I went on about the uh, particular Christianity in Little Women and the ethos of being good for the sake of goodness itself. That's transcendentalist ideology, but even though I mean, I've learned more over the years about Louise May Alcott's family and social circle. During my reread of Little Women, this influence that saturates her book still wasn't as apparent to me as it should have been. And I think that's because it's so easy to get sucked into the world of Little Women, a specific world that acknowledges the dynamics of gender and not much else. It's simultaneously the most historical and ahistorical book. So even though March is less than 300 pages, not a sweeping epic novel. By telling the story with a broader canvas, Brooks gives you the space to notice more about Little Women. And that was particularly true for me when it came to the transcendentalist aspects. There's a key aspect to March that I can't reference for spoiler reasons, but that in my opinion elevates this novel. It was a slow burn for me, about a third of the way through I was enjoying myself, I thought the writing was high quality, but I wasn't sure why this had won the Pulitzer Prize. But it subtly builds on itself until it reaches a point where you question so much about this book and about undertones in Little Women. There are questions that come up about morality and the way we all fixate on the idea that we personally are moral people. It makes you ask questions about the lived value of money, as I mentioned earlier about the March's marriage, elements of the feminism in both novels, and the character of Marmee, to whom Mr. March is, is writing letters throughout in here. Revisiting Marmee was my favorite part of this experience, and I was swept up in the way Brooks handles her. So overall, I think it's pretty evident that I sincerely recommend this pairing, both for the reading pleasure of them and for the, the banquet of food for thought that they offer. Whether or not you've read Little Women already, I think people rely too much on the distant, fickle memory of their childhood reading of it when the adult mind is so much better equipped to recognize everything that's going on in here. And March is going to equip you even more to both appreciate and interrogate the classic. So um, if you've gotten to the end of the video, I feel like we should have some kind of a code word for the four or five, five of you who made it here. Uh, write the word plum like the fruit 
in your comment to signal that you're one of the cho chosen few. Thank you. And uh, please let me know your thoughts on these books. Nothing would make me happier, clearly, than continuing this discussion below. Bye, guys, and I'll see you soon for another video.